My name is Bruce Jones. I'm the Vice President of the Foreign Policy Program here at Brookings. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this important event on U.S.-Mexico security cooperation, which is one part of a wider Brookings initiative on analyzing the opportunities and challenges in the U.S.-Mexico relationship at a critical time, I think, in both countries' history and in the relationship between them. And I do stress both challenges and opportunities. Uh, the two countries to continue to, continue to negotiate the details of the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, the trade agreement that would follow up with NAFTA, TMEX, as our friends in Mexico, I have learned, uh, call it. Uh, from my own vantage point, I believe that the passage of UXMA, as the Trump administration calls it, I can't remember what the Canadians call it, or it has three names, this thing. Uh, I believe it's vital for Mexico, and it's essential for the United States, that we pass the, the revised agreement. I think there's much too little recognition in the United States of how important it is for our economy and our security to have a prosperous Mexico on our southern border. And I think there's a lot that we can do to grow together, including in new areas like energy, uh, where we have a, a real potential to collaborate. But there are serious challenges as well. And despite unprecedented levels of security cooperation between the two countries over the past decade, Mexico has not really succeeded in suppressing rising levels of criminal violence. Weapons flows from the United States add to the difficulty. At the same time, the opioid crisis in the United States is partly fueled by supply uh, from and through Mexico. Migration issues continue to loom large in the bilateral agenda. And I think there's a, a political challenge we need to think squarely about, which is that President Trump and President López Obrador have outlined different security priorities. Uh, AMLO has declared an end to the war on drugs and seeks to focus on violent crimes in Mexico, understandable. Uh, but meanwhile, President Trump remains very concerned about drug uh, flows and migrant flows across the U.S. Mexico border, quite apart from the broader discussions about the wall. So I think that there is an agenda of tackling tough challenges, but also an agenda of building on and sustaining cooperation and a partnership between the two countries. And at Brookings, we hope to contribute to all this by offering ideas, honest critique, uh, and opportunities for convening among experts and colleagues. Uh, and that's the context for today. Uh, I want, before introducing our guest speaker, to pay tribute to Vanda Feldbad Brown, who's the uh, sort of activist in our ranks on this issue, and a superb scholar uh, of Mexico, among many other things, and I think is making a very important contribution to American understanding and wider understanding of Mexico and of the U.S.-Mexico relationship through her prolific writings on the topic. So I want to turn now to introducing our uh, distinguished guest, Ambassador Barcenia, who is the new Mexican, new-ish Mexican ambassador to the United States and who will deliver a keynote address on President Operador's security policy. So welcome to Brookings and welcome to the United States. Ambassador Basenia is a career diplomat and served most recently as the permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations agencies in Rome. It's a very nice job, by the way. Uh, <laughs> she also serves as ambassador to Denmark and Turkey and in key positions in the foreign ministry, including as head of the Department of Migrant Workers and Border Cooperation in the General Directorate of North America. So extremely well prepared for the challenges that she confronts as ambassador to, to the United States. Followed that, we'll have a discussion by our own, led by our own Vanda Feldbad Brown. Uh, and then we will welcome on stage after that Professor Rafael Fernandez de Castro, Director of the Center for U.S.-Mexico Studies at UC San Diego, and Ambassador Tony Wayne, a career ambassador and former U.S. ambassador to Mexico and Argentina, and Assistant Secretary of State, now at the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars, and a longtime friend of Brookings. Uh, they will present findings and recommendations from the new task force white paper on U.S.-Mexico security dynamics in which they and Vanda participated. But for now, it's my pleasure and my honor to invite Ambassador Basenia to the podium. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here at Brookings Institution, such a well-renowned think tank and so respected in Mexico. And with my friend Rafael, with my colleague and friend Anthony Wayne, Wanda Piccoli, it's, it's so. Uh, I've been, I'm newly arrived, and as as you see, and I've been talking particularly on USMCA ratification on issues of migration, uh, discussing both privately and public uh, these matters, but it's the first time that I will address the new security strategy of President López Obrador and how this is related also to the other areas of the bilateral relationship. So 
I would start for recognizing and underlining that cooperation between Mexico and the U.S. regarding security is fundamental for the stability and prosperity of both countries and the whole North American region. We have both been affected by the challenges posed by Ill illegal trafficking drugs, people, money, and guns, which is why we, we will continue to work based on the principle of co-responsibility, of shared responsibility. The new security policy of the Mexican government represents a fundamental shift in the way Mexico has dealt with security in the past decades. In the previous years, Mexico fought organized crime with an almost exclusive reliance on punitive and traditional approaches that privileged the criminalization of drugs and the use of military might to take out drug kingpins. This resulted in the fragmentation of cartels and the rise of drug-related crimes like theft, kidnappings, extortion, and violence. While a decisive, decisive action from the Mexican government was long overdue, and so that's why we had to take these measures, the strategy that was put into place achieved important results in some areas, but faced unintended consequences for human lives and the environment, the general environment of citizenship security in Mexico. In response, President López Obrador decided to articulate a new security vision that represents a turning point in the way Mexico has understood security and peace for the past two decades. The main uh, plan has, was a, a strategy on security, public security. One of the main elements was to separate again the ministry, uh, the labors of security or, or the, the tasks of security and governance were in only one ministry. That was Secretaría de Gobernación. President López Obrador decided to sp split them again, having la Secretaría de Gobernación for governance issues, human rights, uh, migratory issues, and the issues of public security. And uh, with this, this is a structural change on the way we organize our answer to the challenges of public security. And then the public strategy has eight pillars that are totally interrelated among them. The first is anti-corruption. The second is economic inclusion. The third is human rights protection. The fourth pillar is regeneration of ethics in society. The five, a new approach on the fight against drugs. Six, peace building. Seven, prison reform. And eight, a new perspective on public security and national security, including the creation of the National Guard. These pillars put forward a new vision that is human-centered and considers that both the enforcement actions of the military and the newly created National Guard must operate hand in hand with a comprehensive approach to prevent the, repeat, the, to the, re, the recurrence of violence by addressing its root causes through institutional consolidation, reconciliation, and a social, political, and economic transformation. It also seeks to revamp previous mechanisms that prove successful in specific areas, including bilateral mechanisms with the U.S. that have relied on trust building and fluent communications between enforcement agencies. In this sense, we recognize that Iniciativa Merida has been a fundamental component of our bilateral efforts on security, but it needs to be reviewed strategically in order to ensure its effectiveness and make sure its main goals adapt to the current priorities of both countries. So we have started an evaluation of Iniciativa Merida in Mexico. We have started conversations with the U.S. on the need to evaluate Iniciativa Merida, identified where are the successes and where Iniciativa Merida has not worked as was expected, and how to go forward in this bilateral cooperation. The greatest value of the Merida Initiative we recognize is having contributed to the construction of mutual trust and cooperation between Mexico and the United States. The initiative helped to develop a collaboration scheme with the United States that allows complementing Mexican efforts to, to fight organized crime and strengthen 
our institutional capacities. 11 years after its implementation and with the start of the administration of President López Obrador, it is important that both the U.S. and Mexico review their modalities and objectives of cooperation in security matters on their Merida, privileging institutional strengthening and development, training and exchange of state-of-the-art technology. On this topic, I want to make clear and underline that our security cooperation with the U.S. is and will remain one of the top priorities of our relationship with the U.S. There should be no doubt about it. One fundamental element is to maintain our continued military cooperation also, which has become stronger and has developed on various coordination levels from strategic to tactic. This has allowed us to establish common priorities and reinforce our educational and training programs. We are also cooperating closely to prevent human smuggling and arms and ammunition trafficking through information sharing, training, coordinated patrolling along the border, and with the use of technology at ports of entry. A new strategy for customs has just been launched in Mexico that will increase the common procedures for checking the cargo and also sharing information in real time. In addition, we maintain a continuous dialogue to prevent trafficking in persons that allows both countries to identify where do we have to strengthen our exchange of information and collaboration. Now, for the sake of time, I will address some of the main pillars of the security strategy in no particular order and trying to explain how they overlap and integrate for this uh, new vision of President López Obrador. One of the main pillars of the security strategy, and it would be surprising for some but not for Mexicans, is the fight against corruption. <laughs> According to the OECD, the cost of corruption in Mexico is estimated to be between 5 and 10% of Mexico's gross domestic product. And corruption and organized crime have shown to have a symbiotic relation to one another. Therefore, a successful approach to organized crime is inseparable from a wider effort to eradicate corruption from public life in the country. A notable example already in place is the fight against fuel theft in which the government has invested more than $200 million. But it was estimated that only in 2018, the cost of fuel theft was up to $3 billion U.S. dollars. Furthermore, new wide-ranging constitutional reforms have been passed to strengthen crime proceeds recovery from corrupt practices and to expand the number of crimes requiring preventive prison without bail to include corruption, fuel theft, and electoral fraud, amongst others. Other fundamental pillar that I want to address is the new perspective on public security and national security that includes the creation of the National Guard. One major component of this pillar is implementation of a citizen security approach. The premise of this approach is that the successful public security frameworks are the ones that guarantee the rights of citizens. The legitimacy of policing derives from their integrity in exercising those powers and their accountability for doing so. The other component is the creation of the National Guard, which was approved unanimously by the Mexican Senate and with the majority of votes, only one vote against in the Chamber of Deputies. The National Guard will be responsible for public order and security. At the same time, military forces that have been de facto in control of public security will enter a five years phase out period. Afterwards, they will return to their national security duties. But without the help of the military, without the training of the National Guard based on military discipline, these cannot happen. The National Guard will be under civilian control in a few years, but will operate with the assistance of the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Navy. The, the National Guard will be integrated by the military police, the naval police, and the federal police. 
The military forces will be in charge of developing its structure, discipline, hierarchy, and training. It will have clear accountability mechanisms. Members that commit a crime will be judged by civilian authorities. Only violations to military discipline will be addressed by military authorities. Furthermore, all criminals apprehended will be taken to civilian courts. The National Guard will be deployed in 266 regional sites within the 32 states, and it is expected to reach 50,000 members with a gradual approach. In the first stage, elements from the Army Police, the Naval Police, and the Federal Police will be recruited, as I said so, to join the Guard. Later, the recruitment will be open to all civilian population. All of its members will act in accordance with a protocol on the legitimate use of force that will consider necessity, proportional means, and adherence to law. I would like to um, underline that uh, yesterday I was listening to Senator Vanessa Rubio from one of the opposition parties explaining the, how the Senate reached uh, almost, not almost, a unanimous agreement. It was a negotiation among all the political forces in Mexico. So that means that all political forces are committed to the National Guard and are supporting it. And so I will be supporting their job in public security. The third, another third fundamental pillar is the new approach on the fight against drugs. On this issue, Mexico has devoted unprecedented efforts to eradicate crops, confiscate drug shipments, destroy clandestine labs, and disarticulate drug trafficking organizations. However, the emphasis on the punitive and prohibitionist approach has contributed to generate a spiral of violence. What is worse, drug consumption, both in the U.S. and in Mexico, has continued to rise. This is why Mexico seeks to promote a more effective collaboration with the U.S., but also internationally, based not only on a criminal justice approach, but also focusing on addressing social grievances, reinforcing prevention strategies, as well as strengthening public health and care for victims and vulnerable groups. The rise of the use of fentanyl and its destructive effects on ordinary Americans, for example, present new challenges that will require a closer cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico. I come just from a lunch with the head of customs in Mexico. They were telling me that what is arriving in Mexico is a chemical precursors from China and that most of fentanyl that arrives to the U.S. comes from China. So what we have is that with chemical precursors arriving in Mexico, some groups are starting to manufacture fentanyl in Mexico. And uh, the fentanyl that is arriving to the U.S. is coming basically from China through uh, mail. And a, a good part of it, or some part of it, through Mexican borders. But we are not yet big manufacturers of fentanyl. We are manufacturers of methamphetamines. And what we are seeing at the border is a drop of almost 80% of the seizures of marijuana. They, there's almost no traffic now on marijuana. Uh, uh, also, uh, the traffic of cocaine has been going down considerably. The traffic of fentanyl has been going up more than 100%. The traffic of chemical precursors have been going up more than 100%. And the traffic of heroin is up around 50%. So that means also that the whole system of drug trafficking and drug trade is changing. And that what is going on on the drug uh, trafficking is related also to the human trafficking and to the arms trafficking. If the people or the elements of Mexican security forces and the U.S. security forces are concentrated in fighting illegal traffic of people, then other parts of the border are not well taken care of, and then drugs cross more easily. By the way, drugs cross the borders basically through ports of entry. And that is a characteristic that we need to have in mind always for any cooperation. So that is why 
Mexico. <clears throat> I see. We are ready then to, con to, to contribute to explore new ways to deal with this urgent channel challenge of fentanyl. And while there is not a silver bullet that will solve the problem overnight, we want to generate an honest and respectful discuss discussion based on five main ideas. A more human enforcement, recognize the problem as a health public issue, the issue of drugs, distinction in the regulation of substances, address the root causes of violence and the propagation of crimes through a sustainable development strategy, and make international cooperation more coherent and efficient. We have submitted some of these ideas already to the Committee on Drugs of the United Nations in Vienna only 10 days ago. Lastly, the peace-building approach is worth an individual mention because it is closely related with the rest of the pillars notably human rights protection, economic inclusion, and the regeneration of ethics in society. Mexico believes that a sustainable peace cannot be achieved without a series of interrelated processes in order to address justice, accountability, and reintegration into society. The government will explore the implementation of a transitional justice approach in order to promote possibilities for reconciliation. Amnesty and disarmament, demobilization and reintegration will also be evaluated under clear conditions. Full collaboration with justice institutions, unequivocal manifestation of repent and damaged reputation. This is when President Lopez Obrador said in one of his early morning conferences that what we were going to do was a peacekeeping operation inside Mexico. He was referring to do to this. You know, the basis of a peacekeeping operation is three pillars. It's first, guarantee basic security presence of armed forces and police to stabilize the situation. Second, deal with this demobilization, reintegration, disarmament. Third is guarantee access to justice and prison reform. And what he was saying is we will do this with our own resources. So we will take the conceptual basis of what a peacekeeping operation and peace building operation is, and we will do it with our own forces. And now, fortunately, for the last years, both the Mexican police and above all the Mexican army and the Mexican navy have been participating in peacekeeping operations. So they know all these concepts. They know uh, the ideas that sustain this effort. I will close saying that we expect we expect that this strategy will change the paradigm through which security and peace are understood in Mexico. It's a bold move, but an urgent one after 12 years of increasing violence. And by the way, we cannot expect that results will come very fast. It will take at least six months to start to see the first results of the new strategy. But a close collaboration with the U.S. on all these topics will be fundamental which is why we are determined to carry on a spirit of cooperation that promotes broader and deeper understanding of our common challenges, of our way ahead, of our common future. So I hope that the debates like today in Brookings Institution can help to enlighten this new era of cooperation, can bring new ideas to, to consider, and can underline that without the cooperation, and not only at our common border, but also with Canada and in our southern border, there is no way ahead. The only way to really advance is having this cooperation and understanding the needs and the approaches of the other side. We need empathy and we need to know what are the priorities of each other. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, yes, I have to go there. Sorry. I wanted to skip the questions. It didn't work. Well, Ambassador, thank, thank you, you so much for the absolutely enlightening presentation. This might have been your first speech on security issues and the new security strategy but it's uh, an absolutely sterile speech that gave us tremendous uh, food for thought. Thank you so much for Thank you. Um, sharing it.
Um, perhaps I can start my first question. I'll ask a few questions and then open uh, up for the audience with uh, the amnesty leniency pillar component of uh, the security strategy. Um, no doubt this is the most um, innovative uh, and uh, perhaps one can even say most controversial it element uh, of the strategy. Certainly transitional justice has been applied many times, but in the context of military conflict. Mm -hmm. It has not been applied in the way the administration is conceiving of it uh, in the context of criminality. Mm -hmm. Couldn't you tell us a little bit about who might be eligible uh, for the amnesty? I understand that this is an issue that's evolving. It there is are, evolving. Th there is back and forth. What is the current state of thinking about that? And, and perhaps also um, if you could share with us some ob uh, about the process of uh, conceiving the amnesty leniency law, the consultations that are taking place uh, with civil society and society broadly in Mexico. I think that you're right. This is a, an evolving issue in which it has been a lot of discussion in Mexico. And I would say that uh, there, is, there isn't yet a consensus mm -hmm. on this issue. And that is why consultations with the, the civil society is going on. And it is true that uh, some people think that the transitional justice concept cannot be applied to, criminal, to, to criminality in Mexico, but has been applied, as you said, in, in a context of civil wars and peace processes. I think basically what, uh, particularly our Secretaria de Gobernación has been saying, and you know, she was a judge for the Supreme Court in Mexico, it's uh, that we have a lot of people in jail relating to criminality, basically to drug trafficking, that are not the big drug traffickers, are some young people, some poor people that were either caught as uh, with a small amount of drugs or they were used as the carriers of the drugs. So we need to see if those are really criminality or were just extremely poor or young people that were used or even knowing what they were doing, they have little option mm -hmm. of taking another decision. So um, as far as, I, as, as, as we are following, there is uh, not yet submitted uh, uh, any legal or law on, to the Congress to, yes. so, to approach this. So I think the discussion is going on, but the idea is that we need really to undermine or, or to deal with the causes of the uh, criminality and the insecurity. And keeping young people, let's say 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, young men or young women in jail because they were having uh, a certain amount of marijuana with them, mm -hmm. it will not help to really diminish the criminality. <laughs> so that is the idea. Uh, if if the concept of transitional justice could be applied to other um, big criminals, let's say, and not in the constant context of a peace process, I think that is something to be discussed. I don't think we can um, discard it in principle. Mm -hmm. I think if, if you go even to the Colombian experience, and with the negotiations on that, you know, some of the guerrilla leaders were also accused of criminality and drug trafficking. So it is something that we need to explore. I would not discard it. I will not say that it's just a good idea in principle. It's something to be discussed. Yes, well, in tran tra tra transitional justice processes are often a vital part of a um, uh, peace, uh, a peace deal. Mm -hmm. They're also enormously controversial and indeed your example from Colombia is very apropos in the changes that the Duque administration uh, is seeking through the transitional justice element with potentially vast negative consequences for uh, the peace deal. Never uh, an easy situation. 
I, I would highlight and compliment uh, the effort of the Lopez Obrador administration in having some societal consultation on transitional justice, whether it is applicable in what form, what are the eligibility um, standards. That doesn't always happen. It, it is a vital part of um, building political legitimacy for the process. Not less controversial uh, issue, uh, if I may, is uh, the fundamental change of strategy away from drug trafficking groups. I understand that uh, both President Lopez Obrador and um, Minister Durazo have at various points explicitly disavowed going after cartels. The president said the war on drugs has ended. Yet you have highlighted uh, both the issue of homicides in Mexico that um, are certainly also perpetrated by drug trafficking groups and the issue of fentanyl and the the tremendous uh, death uh, that is causing in the United States and the need for cooperation uh, between Mexico and the United States. How, um, what are the contours and outlines of combining these two elements, the need to cooperate on fentanyl, the need to suppress homicides, and yet going away from focus on the drug trafficking groups? Let's say uh, homicides are not all related to drug trafficking. Sure. And what we have seen in the organized crime is, as I said, is that organized crime has diversified they not only deal with drug trafficking, they deal with kidnapping, they deal with extortion, uh, they deal with illegal traffic of people, they deal with illegal traffic of arms. And maybe those other activities of organized crime have more direct consequences on citizens. Because if you are a citizen that is not really uh, directly involved with drug trafficking, but you receive telephone calls on extortion, or if you are uh, assaulted in highways, or if if you cannot guarantee the private sector safety in your highways, and that is not related necessarily to, to, to drug trafficking, that means that you will give priority to solve those issues. Would that mean that you will not pay attention anymore to drug trafficking? or to fight uh, drug trafficking? No. It gives that you will have to prioritize because what people need in Mexico is to feel safe. The common citizen needs to feel safe. So that's why we are, they will also be working in jails from most of the extortion was coming out. Are we going to stop our cooperation in drug trafficking? No. Are we going to totally stop fighting drug trafficking? No. It's just that the main mantra will not be the war on drugs. The main mantra would be citizens' security, a peaceful environment. But that doesn't mean we will stop cooperating. It is of our interest. It is in the national interest and national security of Mexico to continue to cooperate and to fight drug trafficking but it is not the only priority or the main priority as it was in some of the past years. Maybe because the citizens' insecurity was not as high as it, as it was just in the last few years. Well, I think that the, um, your administration is absolutely right in focusing on citizen safety. Homicides are the essential issue that any country needs to focus on. If there is violence whether through criminality or through conflict, it has tremendously um, negative effects on all kinds of aspects of citizens' life and societal functioning. In, and your words will also be a great relief to many in Washington that it's not a matter of stopping focus no. on drug trafficking, but uh, changing prioritization. Yes, it's just to, to, to give more emphasis on citizen security and also to link citizen security with the new policy of the government of Mexico on human rights. So the new government of Mexico has recognized that we have more than 40,000 disappearances. Yes. We have recognized that there are more of 200,000 people internally displaced. That was not recognized. We have reestablished this committee to look for the missing persons. Mm -hmm. We have reestablished this or established the Truth Commission for Ayotzinapa 
to, re to review again what happened. So I think this has to be understood that the priority for President Lopez Obrador and for President Lopez Obrador as government is human centered, is the person. It's, uh, and of course, we will fight all the different aspects of crime that impinges on the human uh, and the citizen security. But we will work more on the concept of human security, let's say, than on the concept of strictly national security. And my last question for you before I take a few questions from the audience. Um, in announcing the National Guard, President Lopez Obrador and um, Secretary Durazo and other officials emphasize um, the still very, um, very poor state of police forces uh, in Mexico. Um, both uh, the president and the secretary, in fact, also highlighted that the federal police that has received by far most attention in terms of police reform, including U.S. assistance, still faces lack of capacity and corruption. Can you tell us a little bit about the agenda of uh, the Lopez Obrador administration in terms of police reform and also in terms of justice reform and continuing with the very vital and important uh, implementation of the prosecutorial system? Well, I think we will continue with implementation of prosecutorial system. And I think that it's an area that sometimes is not so well known that it's one of the bilateral cooperation areas, that it's included in Iniciativa Merida. Particularly, the U.S. has been financing through IDLO, which is the International Development Law Organization, which is based in Rome, the training of uh, the, the, the state police and municipal police to do some criminal investigations. And also they have been doing the training for the new uh, procedural um, justice. And uh, I, I think that... Um, one of the areas in which Secretaría de Gobernación will give a big priority also is in the follow-up of this uh, reform. Mm -hmm. And having a former minister of the Supreme Court at the head of the governance system in Mexico will be very important. What we are now in this evaluation of the, of the Merida initiative that may have maybe another name, in the future, so that we really reflect what we are going to do in the future. One of the main areas will be the justice reform still, or consider as one of the areas in which we can cooperate more. Uh, on the other hand, um, the National Guard is, is based basically on models that exist in other countries, and as a carabinieri. Basically, we have been working a lot on the Carabinieri model of Italy and the Guardia Civil Española. But if you go through the Carabinieri model and the problems that Italy has confronted and Mexico has confronted, they are very similar. And so we have a lot of, to learn from, from them. So we will be working with Italians on the training also of the, of the Guardia Nacional. But at the same time that we uh, deployed and operate the Guardia Nacional, we will be training the uh, municipal and, and state uh, police forces. What it is uh, important to say that it's even in the maximum, I think the, the federal police, but please correct me, we never reached 100,000 elements, did we? And in, and in Colombia, they have a police force of half a million police, similar to Guardia Nacional. And Colombia is less than, one, than half of the Mexican population. So that means that the police forces in Mexico have always been smaller in comparison to the challenges that we have. Even now for Guardia Nacional, 50,000, it's not enough. We will need to beef up the Guardia Nacional and we will need to train and recruit people. But at the same time that we are recruiting for Guardia Nacional, we are recruiting for INAMI, for the National Institute of Migration. We are recruiting for customs. And we are asking more and more um, school education, more strict on the uh, recruit, uh, recruitment uh, terms. So it is, even with a huge population like Mexico, it's not easy to do it. It's not easy to beef up the Guardia Nacional at the same time that you beef up INAMI, at the same time that you do customs, at the same time, even in other sectors. Sure. The U.S. Embassy in Mexico has 
1,500 employees now, more or less, or even more. The Mexican Foreign Service is 1,300 employees all over the world. That gives you just the size of the challenges that we have in all areas. So can we reach our goals in the number of people of the National Guard on what it will be doing? If we make a huge leap in these six years of President López Obrador, will be a great triumph. We'll be able to fulfill all the expectations? Probably not. But if we go into the right way and we advance and we continue cooperation, I would consider that a triumph. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll uh, take uh, three questions. Please wait for the microphone, introduce yourself, and ask a brief question. This gentleman right here. Ambassador, congratulations on your recent appointment and delighted to hear your remarks today. Could you speak just briefly about how you will try to implement incentives to fight corruption? My own personal view is that corruption in Mexico underlies many of the other issues you talked about and incentives for dealing with it will perhaps be very tough to implement but need that done, especially in the middle levels. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll take two more questions. Uh, two more questions. Uh, Diana. Thank you. Diana Negroponte from Woodrow Wilson. Mm -hmm. Madam Ambassador, thank you for what you have shared this afternoon. My concern is the use of preventive detention yeah. and the number of crimes which are now eligible for preventive detention. What measures exist there to ensure that the rule of law will be complied with and that this will not be used for political purposes? Thank you. And one more. Uh, the gentleman over there on the other side of the room. Uh, Mexico uh, either has been unable to or has chosen not to stop hundreds of thousands of Central Americans from crossing its territory. Is there a solution to that problem? Is it a problem? And if a democratic administration here were to lessen border security, not build any more fencing, what kind of equilibrium do you think would be achieved in the coming years if there were much less uh, attention paid to the southern border? Thank you, Ambassador. Well, first corruption, I would say that for President López Obrador, if we could synthesize the main objectives of his government in three, it would be one, fight against corruption and impunity. So we cannot fight corruption if we don't fight impunity. So there will be more strict measures. You have a more active Secretaría de la Función Pública fighting corruption, uh, uh, increasing competition in the case of tendering or direct, uh, direct calls for, for um, adjudication for, for different contracts. Uh, the, other op the other big objective is fight against inequality and poverty. And the third is... Uh, the fight against insecurity and violence. So I address today basically the third, but we and, and part of the third is also fight against corruption. But I think the the main objective, and and I am convinced that President López Obrador won the election because he fought the campaign based on the fight against corruption. So uh, there are measures now. Are, are being taken. And that is why some of the reforms on preventive detention was really on, related to some crimes that are related to corruption. But what you said, uh, Diana, is true. Uh, the, the congressmen and senators that opposed that reform, they opposed it on the base that it could be used for political reasons and violating human rights. I, I think uh, the option of not doing it was that you, the state would not have the tools to fight those really uh, uh, those crimes. And it is very clear in the case of the Huachicol or the fuel theft. When, when the government launched its campaign against Huachicol or the fuel theft, the question that was asked by most of the journalists, with, uh, and they were totally right, is and why haven't you detained any person? any people responsible for this. 
The problem is that fuel theft was not considered a major crime. So if you could not caught them in fraganti, you could not persecute them. So you could not process them, you could not put them into jail. So uh, it had also to be considered like a major crime, not subject to bail and preventive detention. So it will be like also that, like a deterrent. How is it going to work? I can't tell you. I, I would like to assume that the, with the reform of the judicial system in Mexico, it will work well, and that with the new National Guard, it will work well, that we will be able to really uh, bring into justice the people that are committed these crimes. But we have to acknowledge at the same time that the challenges of the justice system in Mexico are huge. Uh, according to some UNDP reports, only 2% of the crimes that are committed in Mexico have a result, not prosecuted, but have a final verdict. And, and these we have to be, uh, to be aware of. And on the issue of the migration, I think we are having constant conversations with the U.S. administration on migration. To be totally honest, we have uh, a different perception of migration. For Mexico, migration is basically an economic and social phenomena that is related to uh, demographic profiles, labor markets, complementarity, economic forces, and that it should be approached from a human rights point of view. Uh, having said that, we are totally aware that migration has some challenges related to security and to national security. But we don't see migration as a national security threat. We see it really as, a, as, as, as I said, as an economic and social phenomena. I think the, 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 the migration policy of the U.S. right now has a different approach. So what we have been trying is to keep a very open and frank dialogue on how we address the challenges of security related to migration. And uh, our perception is that, of course, we need to fight the illegal trafficking of people. And without any doubt, there is organized crime involved in the illegal trafficking of Central Americans through Mexico to the U.S., and we have to tackle that. And, and we are all the time exchange, uh, trying to work with the U.S. government, identifying the areas in which we can strengthen collaboration, like exchange of information, better state-of-the-art technology to, to do this. But, uh, but at the same time, if we do not address the root causes of migration, because the humanitarian crisis is in Central America, if we do not address the root causes of migration, which is violence, the lack of economic opportunities, climate change and its derivatives like drought in, in Central America, that is why we call in the Northern Triangle, triangle the dry corridor of Central America, 60% of the Central Americans migrating through Mexico to the U.S. come from the rural areas because of the plagues, because of the, of, of the droughts, because of all the problems. And, of course, another aspect, which is family reunification. When, when we had the crisis of, of uh, minor children, unaccompanied minor children, and there were some interviews in Mexico to to the children, and then we, we identify their families in Honduras and Guatemala and asking to the grandmothers, and this was, uh, this was a story that Senator Rubio was saying yesterday, to the grandmother, why did you send your grandchildren, five and six years old, alone through Mexico? So, oh, because their parents are in Florida, and I want them to be with their parents. As simple as that. So that migration has also a human dimension that if you only see it as a national security threat, you forget about the most important thing, which is the human dimension. So are we cooperating? Are we in dialogue with the U.S. authorities on, on the huge challenge of the Central American migration? Yes, we are. Do we agree on everything? No, we don't. 
But that doesn't mean that we are not cooperating. We are cooperating, we are collaborating, and we look forward to find a solution and to find not a final solution, but to find the means and the ways so that people in Central America stay in their places of origin and that people in the south and southeast of Mexico stay in the in their places of origin. Because as President Lopez Obrador has repeated once and again, and it's the same thing that the head, the American, the U.S. head of the World Food Program, David Beasley, the leader of FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, Jose Graciano da Silva, Gilbert Hombo, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and my president, the four of them say migration should be an option and not a necessity. And we need to work with that aim in mind. Ambassador, thank you so much for the very enlightening comments. Uh, please join me in thanking the ambassador and welcoming... <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.